2 Corinthians chapter number 7. I mentioned this last Sunday morning. We come to a book of Scripture, of course, which is the Apostle Paul's second uh, to this church at Corinth. We already talked about last Sunday somewhat uh, at, uh, at, uh, at least a short length at, at least about how the first book to the Corinthians was one that was a scathing letter to them. It was one in which the Apostle Paul uh, showed them what he uh, knew and what he had seen uh, in, their, in their life, what he had heard uh, of sins that was amongst their church. And he, as the, as the man of God, as the apostle uh, to the Gentile churches, did take it upon himself with what he knew to deal with the sins that he knew about. And so he, do, he does that at length. That is uh, the entire uh, thrust of the first book to the Corinthians. And now here in 2 Corinthians, it is a bit more positive. Amen. And there is uh, uh, much that has taken place that has changed uh, the entire emotional structure, if I can put it that way, of this second letter to the Corinthians. So much so that in chapter 7 and verse 16, a verse that uh, has perplexed my mind often as I have read through this book of the Bible and through this chapter of Scripture, that the Apostle Paul, us knowing what was said in the first letter to the Corinthians, uh, one of which we began uh, to unfold this past Sunday morning, that he is able to uh, write to them despite the sin and despite uh, the wickedness that we already know was in their midst and say to them, I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. He says, I am rejoicing. I am giving praise to God that I can, uh, that I have confidence in you, that I can trust in you, that I can rely on you, that there is something that has happened in your life that has produced confidence in me uh, when it comes to you and your activity. And he says this in all things, not just some, not just a few, but in all things. Amen. And so there are great lessons when we uh, consider that I, that verse, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. And I do believe it should be the desire of every child of God that we should want to be a person, a Christian, a child of the living God that instills confidence in our walk with him in the lives of others. Amen. I want to be someone that when I walk with God, it steals a confidence in others concerning my walk with God and their walk with God and to be able to point people to the Lord Jesus. No doubt you have the same desire this morning. And we find here this, uh, this, uh, this statement from the Apostle Paul, this grand statement of commendation has much to say to us about our own life. Amen. But we began last Sunday morning uh, before we truly dig into uh, the, the, that verse in particular, we began to talk about the irony of that statement. And I mentioned about we know what uh, 1 Corinthians that it was scathing and that there was issues in the church, but what were the issues in the church of Corinth that now Paul is saying something has happened in their life spiritually that has instilled him with confidence in their walk with God. Last Sunday morning we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1 through 7 we saw that they had a carnality problem. The Bible tells us there that, uh, that the Bible was saying that uh, they were carnal. Paul asked them time and time again uh, concerning their carnality. He said, are ye not carnal? Amen. He said uh, there in uh, chapter number three, he said that he could not speak unto them as unto spiritual, but he had to speak to them as unto Christians that were carnal Christians, worldly Christians.
Christians, to Christians that were not spiritual. Amen. By the way, the opposite of spirituality is carnality. Amen. Uh, the opposite of a spirituality when it comes to a Christian is a carnality. Amen. Uh, being one that embodies the world instead of embodies the things of God. He said that they were so carnal that he had to deal with them as if they were babes in Christ. Uh, so the carnality had crept into their life in such a way that they were not growing in their faith. That he had to feed them, chapter 3, verse 2, with the milk of, uh, of God's Word and not with meat because they were not able to bear it. It's not that, it's not that they were simply rejecting it, but it was the fact that they were so carnal that they would, could, would not grow and could not grow and therefore his pulpit ministry was hindered by the carnality of those in the congregation and what he could deal with. And I, I'll be honest with you, I have known many preachers that have that if you heard them preach outside of the church that they pastored, they, they, you would think, man, this is the best biblical scholar, this is the greatest theologian I have ever heard, but you hear them in their church and everything is so surface and everything is so simple and everything is just so uh, so uh, just a surface level and there's no growth truth there's no principles to build on there's no depth and I can't tell you brother Tommy how many times I've heard preacher I'd love to preach that way but I can't my people can't handle it they won't handle it. It is a reality even in the world in which we live to where God's people embrace carnality instead of spirituality. And the sad thing is many Christians, they don't just embrace it in moments, but they will embrace it in entire lifetimes of their so-called walk with God. So many Christians stay where they are and never grow beyond where they are because they have a vice grip on the world. And that where they're comfortable and that's the way they like it and they're not interested in changing. And I hope there's nobody in Beacon Baptist Church uh, that is that way this morning. If there is, I beg you uh, come down to an altar. Do business with God where you are in your seat. Ask God to forgive you of being in love with the world and the things of the world. Ask God to forgive you of being such a carnal Christian and get right with God. Amen. And let God help you to grow in and the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. He says there in verse 3, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas, here is the identifiers of their carnality, whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now, he is speaking to these Christians as individuals, but the sad thing is, as he writes this letter, he is speaking to them as a congregation. That it is not just one person or two people that have embraced carnality in their church, but it is the fact that the entire church has jumped on board with the carnality, and now it is not just a carnal Christian, but now there is a carnal church being spoken to here. Would to God that Beacon Baptist Church never becomes a church of carnality. Would to God that Beacon Baptist Church never becomes a church filled with wickedness and worldliness. And so much so, every church is going to have one or two. But when the entire church jumps on the bandwagon and they find one person out of the will of God, and then they begin to jump on the bandwagon, that is headed down a dangerous road of carnality. And we see it here in these verses. There was divisions, and verse 4 and 5 seems to indicate that the divisions was, uh, was centered around who their favorite preachers were. For why one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? Now notice this now. Here's how God wants us to see God's men, especially when it comes to those that labor in a particular congregation. He said, for who then is Paul? 
Who? And he goes on to say, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. That last phrase, even as the Lord gave to every man, that seems to indicate to me that God's will is, is that every creature, every person in the world has a preacher that uh, has been seen in the mind of God as the one that's going to bring the truth to thee, as the one that's going to bring the gospel to thee, as the one that is going to bring the word of God to thee, that they may grow in the grace and the knowledge, the introduction of spiritual truth. It seems to me that God says that there are different men in the life of a person that God has designed in his sovereign plan to be the ones that give the truth to those that make up a church, to those that make up the body of Christ. That seems to me to, uh, to, seem, to see that God has different places for different people. And it's not just one man that gives all of the truth, but it is different individuals as God has so purposed to come into a local New Testament assembly and to feed the people with the knowledge of the Word of God. Who then is Paul? Why is Paul so special? Why is Paul so separated? By the way, this is Paul writing these words. He is saying, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there is nothing truly uh, separate from me than any other preacher. There is no difference between me and Apollos. And when it comes to what God is doing in our ministry, there is nothing that makes me superior to Apollos. He says, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers? But those that come and serve up the Word of God to God's people, those that minister, that they give the Word of God, the ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Notice God's perspective on ministry that he gives through the mindset of the Apostle Paul in verse number 6. Here's what Paul said. His relationship with the church at Corinth was, he said, I have planted do you realize that there are some men of God in our life and in the relationships of God's churches that God has designed to be planters? Amen. It is there, it is God's will for them to found, for them to plant, for them to lay foundation. Every church has a founder. Every ministry has a founder. Every ministry has someone that plants. But then... Paul is simply saying his role in Corinth was to be the planter. But he, they are not to despise Paul because he planted. They're not to despise and turn over the influence and the need of Apollos' ministry in their mind because just because Apollos didn't plant. But he says here, Apollos watered. There are some that God has in the church's ministry to plant, to found churches, to found ministries, to be the one that begins a new thing and a new work and to begin something that God births during that ministry. There are some that plant, but then there's some that God wants to come along to water. Here Paul said, do not look at me as better because I'm Paul and I'm the planter. Do not look at Apollos because of the watering. And then by the way, when you plant something and then you water it, guess what happens after it's watered? Chances are you get you get the right kind of soil and you get the right, you get water on it and then you let there get sunlight to it, something will begin to grow. No doubt there were probably some in Corinth that looked at Apollos' ministry. I talked about last week about Apollos' ministry and how he was how he was charismatic and how he was a great orator and a great speaker and could just say things well. No doubt Apollos was a man with a golden tongue and many ways to turn a phrase and was a master at speech. But here's the thing, though, when you begin to plant and then you begin to water on that which is planted, something will spring up. And for the carnal Christians in Corinth, they would look at that and say, man, look at how 
that plan is growing. Look how Apollos is being used. And there had been some that looked at Paul and, and absolutely uh, just revered him for his works and planting. There were some that looked at the fruit of Apollos' work there in Corinth and said, look at Apollos. We revere him for uh, his oratory skills and how this uh, thing that he is watering upon is growing in great ways. But he said, Paul says at the end of verse 6, it's not for Paul to be commended for the planting. It's not Apollos that should be commended for the watering and the growth that comes from watering. But he says it is God that deserves all of the commendation. It is God that deserves all of the reverence and respect and praise for what is taking place. He says, but God gave the increase. Then, so verse 7, so then neither is he that watereth, or excuse me, he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Amen. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor, for we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. Ye are, ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Amen. He said that Paul is nothing uh, to praise God, or nothing to give praise over. Apollos is nothing that deserves the praise because Paul's planning would be nothing and Apollos' watering would be nothing if it was not for God giving the increase. It's God that deserves all the praise for what happens in the house of God. So he said there is a carnality problem and the, he's telling them these things and saying uh, truly if you Look at things from God's perspective. What we're fighting over uh, truly shows the carnality of the church because these things are not problems. These things are not to be problematic. They are to be praiseworthy. You see what's going on in Paul's ministry and how Apollos has continued Paul's ministry and watered thereupon. You shouldn't say, that's a problem. You should say, I give God all the praise, honor, and glory for what he's doing in Corinth. Amen. There's a carnality problem. Now, let me mention this this morning. Not only in Corinth was there a carnality problem, but look with me at chapter number 5 of 1 Corinthians in verse number 1. There was a chastity problem. There was a chastity problem. Now, this morning I realize that we do have some young kids here. I'm going to keep my, my conversation on this particular subject biblical in my terminology. I trust if I do that, I won't make any parents mad. Amen. If you read the Bible with your kids, you're going to run across some things that you might have to explain. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1 says this. Notice this now. This is in this church in Corinth. Remember this first book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is laying out the sins that they have to deal with. He is letting them know, I am aware of these things, and they've got to be dealt with. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And notice this now. Now, again, I, I, I remind you, this is the same church that just one book of the Bible later, he's going to be telling this same congregation, I rejoice that I have confidence in you, in all things. That includes this uh, chastity area of their life. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, meaning in their church, in their, uh, in their congregation. There's fornication among you in your midst. He said, and such fornication is not so much as is named among the Gentiles. And then he identifies this sin of fornication, that one should have his father's wife. I would say this morning that that sin in a church would be a very big problem. Amen. I would say that that sin in the church is a sin that must be dealt with. 
I would say that that sin in a church would be one that would hinder the ministry of this church. Now, here's the problem. He talks about this sin. It is a sin of fornication. He said that this sin that is in the church is a sin that is so bad that it's not even named among the Gentiles. In other words, there are lost people who do not have the same God that you have, and they are not believers, and they are not saved, and they do not have the Spirit of God working in their life. They are not Christians, and they know better than to live in the way that you are living, saying that you're saved, having the Spirit of God within, saying that you're a believer, and very well may truly be so. He said it is in the church, a sin that is so wicked and somehow it's being embraced by the church when lost people even know that what this is is wrong. And here I think is the idea that he's saying that this particular sin is not even in the world. You say, preacher, are you saying that lost people don't commit fornication and even fornication this way? I wouldn't say that. But what I would say is this, I believe the sin is different because of what he says in verse number 2. Notice what he says in verse 2, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that, ye, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. He is not saying that out in the world you may never find this sin. What he is saying is, is that out in the world where this sin is present, there is a shame and a knowledge of its wrong, that it's wrong, and the knowledge of its wickedness and its sinfulness. But somehow in this church in Corinth, they have themselves convinced that they have such liberty in Christ that they can commit even this sin and God has to be okay with it. When he says you are puffed up, what it literally means is that they are inflated with pride. They are inflated with vanity. They are not only in sin, but they are proud of the sin that they're engaged in. He said the sin that one should have in a very physical way. And all of you that listen, y'all know what I'm talking about. His father's wife. I believe that the reason why the Apostle Paul says his father's wife is because I personally believe he's indicating a stepmother here. Not his, not, not a mother, or else I believe he would have said that. His father's wife would have been a stepmother to this man in the church. What a wicked relationship, what a wicked sin, and the church has embraced it. He did not, t he is not speaking to this individual in the church, and he does not say that thou art part puffed up, indicating a singular subject as this man is puffed up about his sin. We see that on every hand in the day and hour which we live in. We're living in a world filled with people that are brazen about their sin and have no shame about their sin on an individual basis. But the problem is that he is not saying to this man, thou art puffed up, but he's speaking to this church and he says, ye are puffed up. This church is proud of the wickedness that is within it. And there, it is a sad day where churches of the living God see sin in their midst and they collectively come together and they boast in their wickedness. They're proud of it. They're puffed up about it. They are, they are embrazened by it. They are emboldened by it. They, they, look, they are looking, no doubt, at themselves as elite individuals saved by God's grace and granted with a special liberty that somehow gives them a license to sin and live in sin and be as wicked as they can because, after all, God will forgive my sins. He says here, you're puffed up. And have not rather mourned. What he's saying is, is that he believes that when it comes to this sin, and no doubt, according to the Word of God here, it is definitely implied to our heart this morning that then when there is sin in the life of a believer, and no doubt when there's sin in a church, it should be grieved 
It should be mourned just like a death of a loved one. We should grieve and mourn and agonize over our sin between us and God. But we do not see that happening in this church. And the sad state of affairs is, is in a multitude of churches in this world, maybe even here in Beacon Baptist Church this morning, there might be someone you've been living in sin. You've done something you know is wrong. You've given your life to uh, you've given your heart and your life to some sinful activity and you're puffed up about it and you've never brought it to God with agony. You've never brought it to God and confessed it to Him with a broken heart of grief saying, God, I'm sorry. I can believe I did that and broke your heart. I was mentioning this morning in Sunday school teaching on the Holy Spirit of God about the emotions that the Spirit of God has. We taught this morning about being able to grieve the Spirit of God and being able to quench the Spirit of God, being able to do despite to the Spirit of grace. And you know these things like this, this not mourning, this not uh, grieving over our sins, I'm telling you, you may not grieve over your sin, but if you're saved by the grace of God, there is someone that is grieved by your sin, and his name is the Holy Spirit of God. I'm telling you this morning, we find here a church that was in an absolute mess. Notice he says, Paul says, that he would desire that they had mourned, and here's the reason why. He said that he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. Here in verse number two, he is talking about that, they, that, that the right thing to do for unrepentant sin in a church is to take the unrepentant offender and to remove them from the congregation. He said to this church where he said, ye are puffed up. Ye have not mourned. He is saying that the church as a whole has gotten to the place to where they are puffed up. They are inflated in pride. They're proud of what they did. And they're not bothered by their sin. And the whole church has embraced that. And the problem is when the whole church embraces the sin, the whole church aligns themselves with that offending sinner, with the one that is offending God. And what God's will is for the church, it's not for the church to jump on in the sin with them, but it's for the sin to either be confessed and to get right with God and the church be able to go on, or the offending parties must not be, not, not just exit. But the authority of a New Testament church is for the church as a whole to preserve the spirituality of the church body and to see if that offending, uh, that a sinful offending party does not get right. They are to be asked, not by the pastor or by an individual in the church, but to be asked by the church to leave. They are to be removed. Do you see the difference here as we see the word that they that they that he might be taken away from among you? Verse 3, he said, For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. Paul said, I'm making this judgment as if I'm there with you. I'm telling you what you must need to do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When ye are gathered together, ye, the church, this plural, uh, this plural word, ye, ye are gathered together when the church comes together. And he said, and my spirit, the spirit by which I'm giving you this advice and I'm giving you this word of truth and apostolic leadership. He said with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ that the church verse 5 is to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Here's the thing. If someone is engaged in public sin and they will not repent and they will not get right with God and there is a brazenness about it and there is an arrogance about it, 
the church's job in preserving the unity of the church is not to try to make excuses for the sin. It's not to try to find a way to live with the sin. It's not to find a way to just put up with the sinful behavior against the Lord. But it is to make sure, first of all, that the church, of the, 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 the church is taken care of, and secondly, to make sure that the sinning offender is being taken care of. The best thing for that sinner, the best thing for this man that was engaged in fornication was not for the church to pet him and tell him everything was okay. The best thing for him was not for the church to try to just say, well, that's his problem and we'll learn to live with it. The best thing for him was for there to be a public removal from the church body. Because here's, here's what happens. If he can't stay in the church and repent, the next step in removing them from the church membership is if they are truly a born again Christian, that there will be a long for the ministry of that church again. That there will be a longing in their heart for the fellowship. And he said that, the, he said that they are to be delivered unto Satan. That, in other words, this verse 5, this deliverance, the word literally means to give over, to hand over, to deliver up, to commit, to yield up, to abandon, to surrender for the church. To, uh, to, uh, to literally hand him over to what he and the devil are engaged in in this sinful activity. We're going to let, we're going to give, we're going to remove you out from underneath the protection of the church. We're going to remove you from the church body. You are going to be removed from the membership and we are going to let the devil do whatever the devil wants to do to you because you are acting as if you belong to him now. For the destruction of the flesh. You're giving yourself over to a sin that destroys the flesh. You are on dangerous grounds and trying, instead of asking, instead of trying to get everything to just be okay with you in your sin, we're going to, we're going to ask God to let everything get as bad as it can. Why? Because you want to hurt them? No. Because you want what's bad for them? No. Because you want to destroy them? No. Because you want to break their spirit? No. But because there are some people in this brazenness and this puffed up talks about the fact that this man is not in a repentant state and this church has engaged in this repentant state. He had to get outside of the church before he can be brought low enough to where God will begin to deal with his human spirit again. And for him to be able to have through the afflictions in his body, that spirit absolutely mangled to the point to where he said, I've got to do something about this. And he said, the goal is that the spirit would be saved, that there would be a rescue. Now, this is the church that is being commended. A church that is being told, you have got to take this man and remove him from the membership. These are drastic words for drastic problems. He says here, verse 6, your glorying is not good. You making excuses and you glorifying the sin, you being puffed up about it is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little bit of impurity in God's church will wreck the whole thing. One unrepentant sinner will destroy the whole ministry of a New Testament church. Just like a little leaven destroys, it leaveneth the whole lump. It makes the, it makes the, it gives leaven to the whole piece. He says, verse 7, that you must not pet the old leaven. You might, you don't need to try to persuade the new leaven out of his particular sin. That's not going to work. This time here where the brazenness and the puffed up and the arrogance is here, the petting is already over. The persuading is already over. He said the only step you're left with now is purging out the old leaven. You've got to get rid of the old leaven. He said that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with the old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. He said we've got to get rid of malice. We've got to get rid of wickedness. He said but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. What will make a church successful? Sincerity and truth. 
What will make a congregation of people be able to meet in one mind, in one accord, and be the church that God would have for them to be? What will make Corinth here uh, the church that Corinth needed to be? Sincerity and truth, not malice and wickedness. So here he is giving us word after word about this fornicator dealing with fornication verse 9 I wrote unto you an epistle not to company not to keep company with fornicators yet not uh, altogether with fornicators of this word or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters for then much ye needs go out of the world but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat he said, for what have I to do, or for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Hey, Paul is telling them, you don't worry about the sin on the outside of the church. You preach the gospel and you let God deal with them. But there is a responsibility, not just to the pastor of a church, but church, you listen to me. Again, I said when I began last week, this can be preventative maintenance for Beacon. If there ever is unrepentant sin within our church, if there ever is sins of weakness like these or otherwise, it's not the responsibility of the pastor to be the one that exacts church discipline. It is the responsibility and the duty of the entire church to do so. We do not have an option when it comes to church discipline. It is a command from God. You read Matthew chapter number 18. There is a particular setup designed in the heart of Jesus Christ for those that would enter in to the church that is built upon him. And here we find an example of those things being dealt with in a very practical sense. He said that and I believe by this time this common report. By the way, when he said it is, com it is commonly reported, it means that it is truly ever the, the news of this man has spread everywhere. Everybody in the church knows about this problem. It's not a secret. It's not something that's been hidden. By the way, if you read that King James Bible, there is a very big difference between sins that have been done in private and how those are dealt with and sins that have now been brought out into the forefront and publicly. Public sins demand public being dealt with publicly. Private sins can be confessed between you and God. By the way, remember I prefaced this message saying that the Apostle Paul is dealing with this church the way that he is dealing with this church because of what has been made known to him. Paul's hands are tied. He cannot put this on the back burner. He must deal with what comes before him. Again, I say this, and I've mentioned this in messages before, but, you know, I've heard over the years people say about men like me that pastor churches and say, well, and usually this comes from disgruntled church members, and they'll say, well, if you know that sin's in your church, then you shouldn't be preaching against it just because you know somebody's doing it. My, I'll be honest with you, that is one of the most foolish statements I've ever heard when it comes to biblical truth. My responsibility as a pastor is to preach the whole counsel of God. If I don't know about your sin and I jump on your toes, it's the Holy Ghost that allowed it to happen. But I will say this, if I know about sin in our church and I refuse to deal with it either in that office or in this pulpit or both, I am shirking my duties as a pastor. If I know about it, my hand, hey, don't get mad at me if I deal with your sins. My hands are tied, and you're the one that tied them. My duty before the God that I will look eyeball to eyeball to one day and give an account for how I pastored this church is I must deal with that sin. Jesus said that a sheep that goes astray and keeps going astray, do you know what the shepherds answer according to Jesus Christ was that they must do? It's not that they come with the crook and say, okay, let's gently get back 
And they continue over and over again to say, okay, come back. Okay, come back. Okay, come back. That crook is there for those first few times. And then if that sheep will not learn its lesson, Jesus said the shepherd goes to the sheep and he breaks his legs and puts it on his shoulders. Because a sheep that's had its legs broken will learn not to wander off anymore. Breaking legs is not easy. It's not tough. It's not, it's not, it's not easy. It's tough. It's not painless. But the duty of a shepherd sometimes is to take the crook and gently guide them back. But after time and time again of unrepentant sin, there has to be a time where legs are broken. Church, I'm preaching this message because I'm headed after the good part. But I'm telling you, you look at me this morning. This is the truth of God. And as long as I'm the pastor here, that is how I will pastor. And I'm not trying to hurt any feelings. But if anybody in this congregation has any other ideas, then it's up to this congregation to ask a pastor that is loving you enough to preach tough and to pastor the way that that book says to pastor, it's up to you to ask God's man to leave and to abdicate a shepherd that's trying to shepherd you God's way. If that is a problem to this church, you let me know. Because if you want a hireling, you can have one. But if you want a pastor, you've got one. And as long as you want one, I plan on being one. That's God's Word. That was this church. They were in such wickedness that God is telling this church, you have got no doubt they love this man. No doubt they had care for him. No doubt the whole church's desire, if they had any clue of being right with God, would be to want their restoration. But here was the problem. They didn't even want what God wanted for them. And that is also the state of the affairs of our Baptist churches a lot of times. We may not always want what God wants. This church didn't. It took the removal of this man for there to begin to begin to have things pr produced in this church to where way on down the road this next book it wasn't one more time a slap on the wrist. It wasn't one more time a shepherd coming and breaking the legs of a member. It was not, and by the way I say that metaphorically Amen. I don't believe in pastors beating up on their congregation. Amen. Pastors aren't meant to be strikers. Amen. Just in case this clip gets out on YouTube somewhere and somebody says down at that church, I'm saying beat up on people and break their legs. This church didn't want what God wanted until it got all the way to as bad as it could get. Where this church did not resemble one of God's churches anymore. It resembled a cesspool of sinful behavior. But I will say this, and I'm going to be done with this point this morning. I will say this, I thank God that it didn't stay that way. I, stay, I thank God this morning that this church here at Corinth stayed right and Paul was able to commend them down the road. Or excuse me, they got right, and Paul was able to commend them down the road. They had a carnality problem. They had all this bickering and all this strife and all of these issues one with another. They had this chastity problem. Carnality's bad, but then carnality that leads to being unchaste and unholy and impure. What a wicked, what a wicked scenario this has formed into in this church. But God is so big and so wonderful and so marvelous that only God can touch into such a wicked place, into such a wicked heart 
heart and get to the place where Paul looks at it as God's man and is able to give them the combination of combinations when he said I rejoice therefore because how you handled your carnality problem because of how you handled your chastity problem I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in this church in all things what a convicting truth to us as believers this morning every head bowed every eye closed I'm done preaching this morning